Hi, everybody. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Uh, this is a part of a three or four part weekly webinar that we're holding. Next week, uh, the webinar will be on QuizWrite and on Kelly Author for the web. We've been working on a new version of Kelly Author, the tool that we use to write Kelly lessons. And it's now web based. And uh, we hope with this new tool that there will be more interest in people writing their own lessons or taking existing lessons and creating, uh, building on or making adjustments or remixing and repurposing that. Um, and that remixing and repurposing has a lot to do with what I'm going to be talking about today. So my talk today, and I'll shrink myself a little bit here to give myself some room, is on uh, using Elang Dell Press and eBooks in legal education. All right, let's get started. Let me think. Uh, chat and Q&A are both open. Uh, Deb or Elmer, correct me if I'm wrong uh, in, the, in, the, in whatever that is. And um, so, so if you have questions or such, you know, you can drop them in there and there will be plenty of time at the end. I think I've been given like an hour for this talk and I promise you it's gonna be more like a half hour. Uh, chat is not open, Q&A is open, very good. Um, I promise it's gonna be less than a half hour, but it's gonna be dense or fast, all right? I like to move fast on these things. And I've got a break built in. All right, let's get started. So here's my agenda. I'm going to be talking a little bit about agency and open source, uh, why open casebooks are a good start, and uh, beyond the casebook and beyond Cali, and then why this is extremely vital for legal education. All right. So the definition of the word agency uh, here, and the one that I'm talking about here is not the legal definition of principal agents, but rather the capacity or the condition of the state of acting or exerting power. A lot about open casebooks is about giving power or capability to both students and to not both, to students, to faculty, to schools, to the entire legal education system to do what it needs or wants to do in terms of building the educational ecology for legal education, all right? And the way that's, the way that we we make that happen is with, uh, with a term, with, with a combination of uh, open source, and open source mostly refers to software, right? In which you can get at the source code, it's freely available. You're allowed to, and this is critical, you're allowed to redistribute it or modify it and redistribute it, you know, for your own purposes. Um, in, in this case though, the Creative Commons license also comes into play because we're not just talking about software, we're talking about content. And in that case, it's still free distribution, um, but, the, but the same concepts apply, right? You wanna be able to share, use, and build upon the work of others freely and without having to ask permission. So in this case, the open educational resources give you greater agency than uh, commercial content. And that's a key point. I'm not just talking about the educational aspects. I'm also talking about the business model aspects of this. Um, because I think that has a lot to say about where we're going with legal education into the future. So how does this apply to legal education, right? So anything that is, in, that is educational content, that is any of the artifacts that we use to teach our students with, uh, case books, flashcards, podcasts, uh, you could read this slide for yourself. You get my point. Our, our, our opportunities for open uh, source or opportunities for a Creative Commons licensing model that gives you greater agency, all right? So if it's software, obviously it's source code and it's freely available. If it's uh, content, it's free distribution and you share. Um, and most of my talk or the whole point of this talk is about case books, which are the core of a lot of legal education or the beginnings of a lot of classes and about how we can make their free distribution, their sharing, their using and building upon more uh, more capable. All right, so let's talk about open casebooks as a good start. So when I'm talking about open casebooks, sure, sure, it's the paper book, but I'm really talking about the ebook because I want the source code of the book. I want the I want the text in an, in a manipulatable format uh, so that I could do things. I can remix and repurpose the things. All right, I will get back and talk about print in a second in a in a, in a little bit in a little bit, but let me let me start with that. So we did a study a long time ago, but it's still true today, uh, asking students what 
why they prefer ebooks over print books, over p-books. Um, and believe it or not, the number one response was they're lighter. Right now, now, now you may remember we used to all go into a building and sit in chairs together, and we would have to haul our dead tree books around with us. That would be twenty or thirty pounds. Right. Um, that's not happening today, right now with the pandemic, but but we will be back in that. It would be nice if we didn't have to haul our books around. Right. You don't. You can't lose an ebook. At least you can't lose an open ebook. Um, theoretically, you shouldn't be able to lose a, even a commercial ebook because you can always get another copy. You've got proof that you purchased it, or there's a. It's 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 a lot easier to make a backup copy of an ebook than it is of a of a P book at any time. Right. These are these these are just a laying the groundwork here. Right. You can search an ebook a lot easier than you can search a P book. Indexes, indices, and con table of contents, notwithstanding. Um, you know, using, you know, even if it's just a basic control F, right? The, the book in the browser or in a, or in a PDF format. You can highlight or annotate or comment on an ebook uh, many, many ways if, it, if you've got the Word version. Even the PDF version allows for a lot of different commentary type situations, right? You can, you can create comments in Word. You can create uh, different fonts or styles. You can, you can, change the color of the text or the size of the bolding or the change the background of it um, to illustrate different types of comments and things like that. Lots of possibilities with an ebook that you don't have with just a, a p-book where you've got markers that you, you know, permanently uh, color the, the, the paper, right? So with, a, with an ebook, students could, uh, could, could take copies of, uh, of, of chapters drop them into Google Docs, and then create study groups around them. And so they could uh, round robin who's taking notes on the material, or they could all take their notes in the same place and compare notes, sort of like a study group. Um, and you can imagine extending this sort of social aspect to the instructor, maybe inviting the instructor in to take a look at their notes, or the instructor hovers over student notes and says, you know, I see what you did there, let me clarify, or here's some additional information um, there's, there's a potential for instructor-student collaboration over the text um, that, there, that is less so in, in, the, in the casebook model, in the print casebook model, all right? With an open casebook, you could take the actual digital text and using commercial or free tools, turn it into a, a podcast. Um, voices, the, the, the robot sounding voices like Siri or Alexa or stuff are getting an awful, sorry, Alexa, no, stop. All right, my Alexa turned on for a second. The, the, uh, the automated voices are getting a lot better these days and, and the generation, the automatic generation of podcasts is a possibility, uh, I, I think a viable one for letting students create their own podcast so they can listen to the, uh, you know, when their eyes get tired, they can listen to the book while they're running or jogging or walking the dog or something like that. All right, let's crack open the print versus ebook problem. There, are, there, are, have, there have been articles that basically say students learn better from books, as I say, p-books, from uh, according to this new study. And uh, you know, paper reading is more effective than screen reading. My opinion is let the user decide. Um, it's, it's, uh, paper is just another interface I don't think we need to force one or the other on them. Um, if it's a Sorry, situation where this device lost its connection, if it's a situation where it costs more money for uh, for adding the people capability to the ebook or the ebook capability for the ebook, well, that's that, with, with ebooks you could, you could have both. Or at least with open ebooks you could have both. Um, our books are priced as low as we can get them. So we work with lulu.com. Uh, they're very friendly with nonprofits such that if we don't put a profit on it, they won't try to add a profit on it. So they charge you know, just what they need for the printing and the binding and, and, uh, and the shipping. So here's uh, a judicial ethics and conduct. It's a 182 page book, you know, six bucks, 686, right? Here's a more realistic example, a 686 page book. As you can see, it's a, it's a $12 book. Um, of course, uh, shipping is on top of that, and I think that's like another five to ten dollars, depending on how much of a hurry you're in. So, I don't. Uh, I I will concede the argument that if you want the paper book, then you should have it. Um, 
and, and that's perfectly fine. But, but with open books, you can have both. You know, why not both, right? So the last thing is with open books, uh, the price is low. Uh, as in we distribute our case books for free, um, you don't even have to be a Cali member. You know, you can come to the website and, and download our materials. Um, and the cost of case books is, has been getting ridiculous. 250, 200, $250 um, is, is too much, especially if, uh, if you wanted to, let's say you wanted to use two books or you, you really liked some of the chapters out of one book and some of the chapters out of the other book. You're not going to assign two $200 books to your students, though. You'll have a mutiny on your hands. So, so the fact that the price is zero helps a lot, but all the other reasons I think are as or more compelling, which is to say the ability to remix and repurpose. And let me get into that by talking about why this is a good idea for law faculty. All right. So first of all, um, law faculty could take an existing book. No, no case book is a perfect fit for any course, right? There's always the faculty choosing which chapters, which order to teach them in maybe including a supplemental material, maybe pulling out or not teaching some of the material, you know, with, a, with an open ebook, you can do that so that it doesn't look like uh, you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. The faculty member can edit down for a shorter course. They could combine multiple free ebooks into one book for the students. They can add their own commentary. I like this a lot because I, I've often had conversations with faculty where they say, well, I, you know, I don't agree with the way the author explains this topic, but I like the way he or she explains some other topic. With an open ebook, they could go in and, and literally annotate that author's words or uh, add their own side commentary, you know, Talmud, Talmudic like that basically says, this is what he says, this is what I say, you know, uh, for the final exam, listen to me or something like that. Um, and and in, and in uh, of course, with the remix and repurpose ability here, you can reorder the material to fit your syllabus. You know, rip out the stuff you don't want, add the things you do. You know, have at it. Uh, lots of agency there, and this is a key thing. You can do this, and I'll treat myself even further so you can read that. You can do this without asking permission, and so it lowers the barrier. If you have to send an email and say, "Hey." Colleague, it's awfully nice of you to have this book. Is it okay if I do the following? And then that person has to go through a decision of, I'm not sure I want to allow this person who I don't know. The whole point of Creative Commons is all this is, uh, is, is predetermined, predestined. You are allowed to make changes to the materials without having to ask uh, for additional permission. All right. So let me give you an example of that, where which, which comes from a book that we've just published. Uh, Allie Robbins, one of the law school Academic support people at CUNY uh, has just written a, a book. It's a short book, but it, and it's not a case book, but it's but it serves my example purposes well here. Um, you know, a quick reference guide for today's law student. So first of all, wow, that's great that we have a book now for this for for people studying for the bar or preparing for the bar. But you know, every school is different. Every school has different students. Every student has different problems. And so you can imagine taking this book and combining it with your own, uh, your own course, sorry, your own videos, um, your own tutorials or your own Zoom meetings, you know, that you're going to have with those individual students. Great. You might combine it with Cali lessons. We have now a pile of brand new lessons in the law school success space. Um, or you might write your own tutorials or your own um, infographics and things like that. Uh, you know, and you could even take the book and insert those into the book or insert links into the book for that. You know, and, and so each of you individually who is a law school success person or who is a, a, a law professor, because think you think because you can do the same thing with with a textbook, with a case book, um, you know, has the power to to adjust for exactly what you need in, in, uh, in your situation. So you've got lots of students with, like I said, lots of different problems. You know, some of them are having trouble with test taking. Some of them didn't do so well in legal writing. You know, uh, some of them are cash strapped. You know, uh, some of them don't know what IRAC is or something. You know, you can literally, you can, you can micro customize down to whatever the student needs. 
Uh, you know, you can imagine having the Word version of this book open and, and dropping in the pieces that you want and emailing it to the individual students. Um, that might be a lot of work, but that's also what law school success folks do. Um, and my, my, my point being is doing that with a P book, with a printed book, is, is a non-starter. But doing this with an open book when you've got the, the, the Word version or the electronic version is, uh, is trivial, at least technically trivial. So that goes to this point. I think it's wonderful that other faculty are distributing their casebooks, but PDF is not enough to get the full benefit of an open education resource. Um, you really got to distribute the, the Word version for that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those folks in the, when I get there. Now you got to be wondering, what about the sustainability of this? I mean, how is it that Cali can give away their books for free. And, uh, and uh, let me talk to that a little bit. So, so it's not a commercial model. We're not doing this to make money. We're not selling the books and, and getting a cut of the profit. Uh, it's a consortium model. You all are members of Cali, your law schools are. And we take some of that money and we hire authors. We pay them to write the books. And um, the, uh, the, in the commercial model, you know, this is based on me doing a as much reading, as wide reading as I can to figure out what these percentages are. And these are my averages based on all that reading. You know, the bookstore gets 20%, but in the open model where you're downloading the book, that goes away. The printing costs 20%. It costs less with Lulu because of that arrangement I mentioned. Um, and if you're just using the ebook, then that goes away as well. There is no royalty per uh, book. So that, that has to be gathered. So that goes away, although there is uh, money paid to the author up front, but you don't see it in the price of the book. So that works out. Um, marketing, we still spend money on marketing, uh, just not as much. Uh, we don't, we're, 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 we're a little bit too small to hire full-time people to walk our books around uh, the hallways of law schools. And during this pandemic, we wouldn't be doing that anyhow. Um, so there's still a marketing cost, but it's lower. Uh, we, we, do, we do put all of a, a, an enormous amount of Deb's effort, Deb Quintel, who is uh, the reason for the success of all this for us. Uh, one of the reasons it, it is a lot of work in the editorial, uh, a lot of work in the admin, you know, uploading the book, formatting it. Uh, Scott helps out a lot with that. Um, and then, of course, there's no profit. We're a nonprofit. So, those, so that goes away. So we're not talking about having to spend $200 per book to build it, but you know, a significantly smaller amount of money. Um, and it's within the realm of our capabilities since that we published you know, 20 or 30 books. Oh, so it's about halfway through my talk and uh, uh, I decided that I'll well, have a little, uh, a little break here, a little breather, you know, have, a, have a, a, a Zoom virtual background interview. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. I see I'm on slide 41 and there I am. So here's my Zoom virtual background. This is a this is a beaver eating cabbage. Who doesn't want to bring a beaver to their to their next Zoom meeting? If you would like to have this Zoom virtual background, send me an email, jmayer at cali.org, and uh, I'll be happy to um, send you the, uh, the this Zoom background that you can use yourself. All right. All right. Let's take a deep breath and let us continue. Your screen, PowerPoint as virtual, pick the same PowerPoint. And the problem here is there's no way to jump to uh, jump to a, a particular slide number in Zoom. Looked and tried this, but there we are. That wasn't so painful. Now I throw myself back down into the corner and continue. So where was I? Oh yeah, I was talking about the consortium model. So uh, uh, said what I said about that. Um, we do pay faculty, and we pay them serious money to write these case books. Um, uh, generally, they tell us that it's not about the money, but I got to believe the money is a is a serious incentive. Uh, um, it's also about being published. It's also about uh, what they're doing. They believe in our model. Our authors believe in our our open education model, 
and its efficacy, its value for legal education. So like I said, we published uh, dozens of books that way, uh, not just case books. Barbara Glesser finds law school materials for, sex, for success is great for uh, your incoming students. John Fabian Witt, um, this, is, this is an old title, an old uh, edition because the new edition has Karen Taney of Berkeley as a co-author. Um, William Kratzky, several books on corporate income tax. Ruth Ann Robson at CUNY has written a couple of constitutional law books for us. Um, there's the second one, First Amendment. Greg Germain's book on bankruptcy law and practice. We do get lots of downloads, uh, sorry, lots of uh, activity from people outside of legal education, uh, which is say outside of law schools who want to download our stuff. I, I'm a little scared that they're trying to learn the law from, from case books, but then again, you know, uh, that, that's, that's fine by me. That's why our stuff is made available. Uh, Steve Johnson's wetlands course, um, he, he, he not only wrote the book, he wrote uh, a series of uh, small Cali lessons and, and linked to a bunch of videos from right within inside the book. Um, you know, he's, he's always pushing us, he's on our board of directors, he's always pushing us to go beyond the case book, right? Um, we, we, we came up with a, a coloring book, which I hope some of you know about, uh, which is free. Uh, it probably works better as a paper book in this case, um, you know, buy some colored pens and things like that. Uh, calm down and all the images are taken from from uh, artist images from inside of Cali lessons. And so there's always, there's, there's a little bit of legal education going on with this, uh, with this coloring book. So all of these are written by law faculty. They're all reviewed by law faculty. Both we pay the authors, we pay the reviewers and they've been downloaded. It's, uh, this is an old slide, more than 150,000 times. Um, we're really happy with how things are working out and, and I get daily positive feedback from this. So it's working out good. So here's another way to look at this, a 200 hour casebook. And if you adopt it for just one reasonably sized course, 40 students, that's $8,000 saved for your students. So adopting just one E. Langdell casebook in this example would pay for your entire year's worth of Cali dues. Um, that, that's a stunning statement, but it's true. It's true. Just adopt a book. Now, granted, the students pay for the books, not the schools, but there are models by which you can, as a school, could recapture that, raise their tuition, um, you know, uh, benefit from the goodwill that you're giving to your students by demonstrating this. You know, uh, there's all sorts of uh, ways of thinking about this that make this a very positive thing for law schools to do, all right? Oops, there we go. Um, you know, let, let's extend this out just a little bit. So one student buying three books, you know, every semester, um, but there's two semesters. Well, that would come out to $1,200 per student per year. And this, this is the extreme example that if you adopt a lot of case, a lot of open case books. And if you're the average law school, I know there's law schools that's smaller than this and many law schools larger than this, but if you're 500 students, uh, you, you know, that's $600,000 of books a year that you could be saving your students. And that would be some pretty positive press. And some, and, and, and if you understand and buy into the, the, the efficacy of open materials, then, then I believe you would, you know, that's like a double benefit, it's like a triple benefit. You know, uh, at present, if, uh, if you're a school with 500 students and you're paying the $8,000 of uh, Cali dues, that's about $16 a student. So, um, you know, I, I hope we're a bargain. I hope you think the same as I do that this is a bargain. And if that doesn't convince you, let me let me go beyond the casebook in Cali and say, besides the fact that we're doing this project with eBooks, we're also publishing a thousand lessons. Uh, we're also publishing an ecology where you can run these lessons and get student grades out of them or student analytics out of them uh, using uh, lesson link or lesson live. Um, you can write your own lessons or write your own quizzes using software we've developed. We eat our own dog food. We write software that we use it to make content for it using Cali Author or QuizWrite. Um, 130 schools participate in the uh, Cali Awards program where the developers of A to J Author, which can be used for experiential learning and also 
obviously we sponsor the conference every year for 30 years. And I've been getting a lot of compliments lately uh, on, uh, on the mini course that we held uh, earlier this summer. So, you know, the, the, the savings from the book for, uh, for Cali dues goes way beyond just books for due sort of thing. I guess that's the point I wanted to make. So let me talk about Beyond the Casebook and Cali, and I'm, I'm getting close to wrapping up here. There are other players in this space, and God love them. I'm glad they're out there. Semaphore Press has a deal where the, you can actually download their books for free, but they, you know, they, they nudge you towards, you know, you should pay something. And they even have a recommended uh, amount. I think it's like $30 or, or something like that per book. Um, and then there's individual entrepreneurial law professors who are out there uh, creating case books and copyright, uh, Grimmelman and internet law. Um, and I know there's many others, but I grabbed these three. But one I wanted, but, but another crowd I wanted to especially point out was um, uh, uh, Harvard. And I'll slide my head over to here so you can see the open casebook.org. So Harvard's H2O project is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a similar, but not a same effort as, as Ewing Dell. Um, they sit on top of a giant database of case law. And the idea is you pull the cases out yourself and edit them down. And it creates a web-based, uh, uh, with a really cool, really cool interface, a web-based uh, book that you could then publish to your students. You know, they follow the link. You can export that, I know, to a PDF. I'm not sure about Word. I'll bet it is as well. Um, and even better, you can, others can clone the same book. Other faculty can clone the book and start from your efforts or from somebody else's efforts so they're not starting from scratch. Um, it's a great, great project, and, and, uh, and, and I'm appreciative for them working on this and being in the same space as we are on this. So why is this vital for legal education? And here we are doing pretty good on time. Yep, I'm exactly 30 minutes right now or 29 minutes and we'll open for questions. Law is complex, getting more complex. And as a result, you can't be teaching from the same old models of everything is just towards, everything is just contracts. Really the way people need to learn is, is with the law in context. Um, and it's not as simple as the, as, the, as the strictures we put on the names of our courses. Um, and so that implies a rewrite of, of all of our casebooks, you know, in a way that would be uh, silly, I believe, of us, you know, because it could be anything. It, it's, it, it's becoming a lot more amorphous. Um, and, I, and I think you've got to look at an open model so that a course being taught can pull things from multiple places. Uh, legal education is uh, way more than doctrine, you know, memorizing and regurgitating the law these days. Uh, there's, there's tech competency, but only some. There's practice, you know, negotiation and communication skills, things that don't fit into the typical casebook um, lockstep. Um, and, and so the new class of teaching materials may not look like a casebook at all. I believe that understanding this business model and this technological delivery system, this is legal education's tech competency. They should understand that the materials that they, that they should own the materials that are at the core of legal education. It's a core competency and it shouldn't be outsourced uh, where, where it gets uh, DRM'd or where it gets siloed, where you get locked in um, by a company whose main decision making is going to be how do we keep making our money? How do we keep making our profit? All right. Um, I'm, I'm starting to think there's no such thing as distance learning anymore, right? It's just learning. Um, when you send students off to read the book, when you send students off to run a Cali lesson, they weren't in the classroom in front of you, but we didn't call that distance learning. It's only when there's a little box guy in the corner talking at you in real time over Zoom, do we seem to call that distance learning? Um, so we should stop just calling it distance learning. All, all, everything that we do is learning. And, and, and I hope that this idea of agency is something that we can expand, that, that expands beyond just casebooks, but into our Cali lessons. I'd love to have a giant database of multiple choice questions that people can pull on, um, podcasts, uh, a, a whole carnival of, of cool things that we can do if we start thinking in terms of remixing and sharing 
and in terms of giving the students agency to construct the educational journey they want, giving faculty the agency to change it as they see fit for their students and for their goals, and seeing the school have agency to do this because of the different types of curriculum they might use for different programs, all right? So I just uh, gave away my slide. You know, uh, students should learn in whatever media suits them best. If it's paper, if it's an ebook, if it's a Kindle, have at it. Faculty should be able to create and innovate with the, with the best materials. Um, and law school should have the ability to innovate with new tools, new markets, new methods of delivery, credentialing, and assessment. All right, wrapping up. So that's it. That's that's my talk. Uh, there's 12 of us at Cali uh, pulling this off. I think it's sometimes uh, a miracle, um, um, but it's not. It's it's good engineering. It's uh, smart decisions. It's hard work um, uh, done by the other 11, other 10 people at Cali. I, I just coast on all of their wonderful efforts. Um, and uh, I hope you uh, found this interesting. So that's my talk. Using Yee Langdell and ebooks in legal education, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, you know be prepared to answer any questions that might come up. You know, pop open. Norm Norm has asked if the user does not need to be from a Cali member school, how do they get access to Yee Langdell? Just go to the Cali website, elangdell.cali.org. And if you choose the, you know, you'll notice that you don't have to be logged in to download uh, uh, any of our books. Now you do have to be logged in if you want to run and, and have to be logged in from an, uh, a Cali member school to run any of our lessons, right? Those are not open to just anybody. I see that Deb has put my email into the chat. If you want the, uh, uh, if you want your own copy of, of uh, Beaver Beaver Eating Cabbage, um, heck, if you want, um, my I actually had two breaks in the original one, but my second favorite one, of course, is Chunk. Here he is, Chunk the um, um, uh, Woodchuck. That's right. Uh, the story here is that there's a fellow with a garden and a wildlife camera and the wildlife camera has a little piece of glass over the lens and Chonk likes to stand there and look at himself it acts like a mirror so he feels like he's having having a meal with a, with another woodchuck um you know, so if you want either of those email me all right i'm not seeing questions uh flooding into the q a um by all means, if you want to ask me or anybody at Cali a question, email me at jmayer at cali.org. Uh, follow me on Twitter at John P. Mayer. Um, and um, see you all next week when, we're, when we talk about Cali author for the web and uh, quiz write.